and welcome to the 29th meeting of the Education and Skills Committee. Can I remind everyone to please turn their mobile phones to silent or off so they don't disrupt the meeting. Uh, our first agenda today is a decision to take um, business in private. So um, can we take agenda item three in private? Thank you. Agenda item two is um, school support staff data. Uh, it's an evidence session on the availability of information on school support staff data collected as part of the school staff census. Uh, the f session will focus on the changes to the presentation of statistics, including merging categories relating to additional support needs, support staff, and changing the publication status of a number of categories, so staff figures are now available on request, as opposed to being published at standard. Uh, can I welcome to the meeting this morning, uh, Roger Halliday, Chief Statistician and Data Officer, Alistair Anthony, Statistician, Head of School Staff and Pupil Census Statistics Team, Laura Meikle, Head of Support and Wellbeing Unit, Learning Directorate, and Mike Wilson, Acting Deputy Director of Education Analysis at the Scottish Government. And a very warm welcome, but we'd like to invite Mick Wilson to make opening comments on behalf of the panel. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I thought it would be useful just at the beginning to put the data that we're here to discuss and the points that you've just listed um, into a bit of context, um, both in terms of the statistics themselves and in terms of the processes used to collect, assess and publish uh, those data. There's a range of, of data collection exercises undertaken uh, on education throughout the year. There's a number of those uh, are census type collections which are conducted in parallel uh, over the autumn period. Um, we are at the moment at the end of the 2018 collections on, across a range of things. Whilst all those collections are related and happen in parallel, they are each distinct exercises and have uh, some important differences between them, and no doubt we'll come to some of those throughout the conversation. Primary sources of, of data for us are the pupil census and the teacher census, which are the ones that are probably most, uh, most well recognised across the system. We also conduct the non-teaching school staff census from which the support staff data come, uh, the primary school class data collection, school establishment collection, and every two years we collect data on attendance and absence and exclusions in schools. There's a range of other collections carried out throughout the year as well, including uh, collections on school meal provision, on physical education provision, and a range of data exercises relating to pupil performance and outcomes. The administrative collections uh, that happen in the autumn are supplied to the Scottish Government directly by local authorities, and in some cases by schools, particularly grant-aided schools. Um, as such, the quality assurance process starts um, with their initial collection of the data which they use for the day-to-day -day running of, of the education system. Uh, they hold those data on their management information systems uh, for regular use. Quality assurance is, is built into each stage of the process, so schools, local authorities and the Scottish Government all have a role to play in that process. The precise arrangements vary a little bit uh, between the collections depending on the nature of the data and the amount of detail that we collect, but ultimately the data are signed off by uh, directors within, uh, within local authorities prior to being published by the Scottish Government. During the course of those administrative data collections, we collect and process what amounts to tens of millions of pieces of data relating to 2,500 schools, around 700,000 pupils, 70,000 teachers and over 20,000 support staff across the system in Scotland. This enables us to publish, uh, us, this enables us to publish well in excess of 100,000 statistics. In addition, we release uh, bespoke data sets and analysis throughout the year for a wide range of users, including researchers and academics, the media, the general public, politicians and parliamentary committees. The Code of Practice for Official Statistics sets a framework uh, for our approach to handling data and producing statistics. It's there to ensure that quality, value and trust in statistics uh, produced by organisations such as the Scottish Government, and it provides us with some specific guidance uh, on specific aspects of producing statistics. For example, ensuring burden on data providers is proportionate and ensuring that the appropriately qualified professionals are used throughout the process. Ultimate responsibility for ensuring the code of practice is adhered to within the Scottish Government rests with the Chief Statistician. The purpose of these administrative data, data collections in education, as with all other sectors, is to describe. It, it's to, to, to paint a picture of the subject to which the data relate. They can only ever play back practice within the system or the picture of the system itself. They do not and should not define or constrain practice within a system. However, they do and should facilitate debate and discussion about those practices within the system. Any statistical collection or publication doesn't exist in isolation or for its own sake. 
It needs to seek to remain relevant, reflecting current or likely future situations, whilst ensuring as robust and accurate a picture as possible can be presented. What we publish and how we publish it, therefore, needs to be a balance between a number of factors. They include known limits or restrictions to the data, previous practice on publication, public interest, current issues and context in which we are presenting the data, and the availability of other sources of information on the same or similar topics. Our approach is generally to publish as much information as possible, in as accessible a format as possible, without proactively releasing data which we know to be misleading, incomplete or erroneous. Education data are probably more in the spotlight now than at any time in recent memory. This brings with it a requirement to continually improve their fitness for purpose, but it also brings us closer, more often, to the practical limits of the power of the data that we collect. Therefore, simply replicating what has gone before will not always provide the most useful or accurate data, and it's right that we take action to investigate and address any anomalies in the data or issues raised by data providers themselves throughout the process. As a final note, no decision to make changes on the presentation of official statistics is taken lightly. In this particular case, the requirement to reflect ongoing changes in the relative importance of support staff data, as against other elements of education data, teachers and class sizes, for example, meant that a deeper examination was warranted when a potential issue was highlighted to us. The resulting changes provide, in our view, a more reliable data set than would have been the case if we'd left those unaddressed. Thank you very much, Mr Wilson. Can I go first to Mr Greer? I'd like to start uh, just on the, the process in terms of the, the timeline of publication. So typically the data is collected for a day in September, uh, initial publication in December, supplementary data around March. Obviously this most recent set of data, the uh, supplementary set came in July. Was that a one-off because this was the year in which you began to, to make the changes that we're here to discuss or will this be the new uh, timeline going forward for publication of data? Yeah, that's right. The um, reason the data was released uh, slightly later than it has been in the past was because we did those additional quality assurance checks and uh, we've announced that the uh, um, supplementary data from the staff census and the people census and whatnot will come out in March 2019. Right, thank you. Um, so the data that, that was published earlier this year, the supplementary data, when it was published, uh, the publication came with a notice saying that um, additional uh, data would be provided on request. When I uh, requested that additional data, my request was treated under freedom of information legislation. That seems like a, an odd and onerous process to go through when you are soliciting requests for that additional data. Will that be the process going forward? Uh, so the data that we will publish in March 2019 um, will be available on the, the website um, as, as normal as, as part of the published stats tables. Um, we haven't yet decided what um, we will do about the information that we released um, as management information, those additional categories of staff that weren't proactively published originally. Um, uh, and, and so that's a decision we've yet to take as to how we'll, we'll make that information available. I think just to add to that, it's, it's, it's relatively normal practice for us to treat a range of data requests as, as freedom of information requests. Strictly speaking, any request to Scottish Government is a freedom of information re request, as the legislation uh, says. And that's, that's, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr Wilson, but that's not the case. I mean, we, we, as members of this parliament, routinely make requests to the government that are not freedom of information requests. Every day. That's what MSPs do. It seems like a very odd and onerous process. It seems to significantly increase the workload on your teams, I would imagine, to treat it through FOI legislation. No, I, I, I don't, rec don't recognise that the, the treating it through the FOI process uh, adds, adds to that at all. I think um, a number of non-routine requests for data will be treated as, as freedom of information requests. In this particular case, uh, this would have been the first time that we'd released that level of detail um, for, uh, for that particular set of data. So I think it was, it was right that we tr treated that through a, a formal process. Um, it also meant that we could release that level of detail um, to everybody, to all users at the same time, because we publish our, our FOI responses, um, rather than uh, simply to the, to the individual making the request, which would be the case for, for most of the kind of ad hoc data requests that we get um, as the more routine throughout the year. <coughs> Excuse me. Right, I, th I think we need to come back to that, but to, to move on to the specific changes uh, around um, 
classroom assistance and additional support needs assistance that are now collected under the, the are published under the PSA category. So the information for the, the counting of those two categories as separate categories uh, was information you possessed. So when I requested it, you were able to provide me with it. Uh, now I understand the, the issues of, for example, some local authorities have got 700 staff listed under one category and zero under the other. Um, and we can come back to, to that as well. But given that you, for this year, had uh, both categories, could you confirm if in years going forwards uh, you will only request uh, a count of uh, pupil support assistance from local authorities? So you will not be requesting information under two separate categories and publishing under one. You will be requesting it under just one category in the first place. Uh, the information that we've collected as part of this year's collection for the 2018 census um, hasn't changed from what it has been in previous years. So we still collect the information on classroom assistance and ASN auxiliaries um, as we have done previously. So if, you, if you're collecting information on both categories, why publish as just one category? Because the information is available on request for both categories. I requested it, it's now in the public domain. Mm -hmm. Why publish as pupil support assistance when you have both sets of data? So the reason we've done that is, is based on the feedback that we've had from local authorities about how they assign their staff to those categories and, and the staff roles and terminology that they use um, in, in practice when, you know, in, in schools and whatnot. And it's a decision we've taken as a, a, you know, as a, as a statistician that um, the most appropriate way to represent the data we've collected is to present it as people's support assistance because that's what local authorities are telling us is the, the terminology that they actually use in schools. What alternatives to merging the data for publication did you explore? I mean, for example, did you explore working with uh, local authorities on clearer guidance for the, the definition of what, mem what kind of uh, staff role would fit into either of these categories? I'll take that one. I think the other option, there was a range of options that, that we thought about, I think, at the beginning of the process when the issue was first raised. Uh, um, I think it's fair to say that we, we had a fair, pretty open mind about where we might end up with solutions to this. Um, what, what we don't want to end up doing is simply produce, producing data on a basis that we know to be, to be questionable. So we know that authorities struggle now to assign staff to the specific categories that we currently collect data for, um, rather than to make a uh, fundamental change to the underlying collection process in, in, a, in a hurry, if you like, um, we decided to take this approach of combining those categories. Um, had it been clear that these were, the people support assistance were a new type of staff or, or something additional to the staff that we were collecting data on before, then of course one option would have been to add a further category to the collection and we could have reported on uh, an extra a category of people support assistance on top of the two uh, that are there already. What became very clear very quickly from local authorities is that, that is not the case. Um, people support assistance cover a wide range of, of, of tasks uh, which incorporate some of those undertaken by the other categories that were listed uh, in the collection. So on that basis, uh, it was preferable to, to combine those and, and kind of uh, present what we think is a more accurate overall picture of the resources in that area rather than to falsely delineate between uh, the two categories that were that were in the collection initially. Do you understand the concern that exists when one in four young people in Scottish schools have an identified additional support need, but the published data has now been narrowed to the extent that we would, until, request of, uh, until the further data requested is published, be unable to tell how many support staff are working with children with additional support needs? I can understand. I can understand the question certainly. However, I don't think the uh, what we've learned from local authorities tells us that the categories that we had before did not provide uh, an accurate picture of the number of staff who were working with children with additional support needs. How, how does the currently published information provide an accurate picture of the number of staff who are working with additional support needs? Because it just provides a generalised category of pupil support assistance. So, so I think that's that's precisely the issue in in that we have a range of staff across the system now who are working in a number of ways with a number of different uh, pupils in a number of different scenarios uh, across across schools. Some of their time is spent working with children with additional support needs, some of their time is not. Um, and, and to delineate them on the basis of their, what now appear to be outdated job titles, um, would, would provide a false picture. Um, pupil support assistance, we think, provides a more robust picture 
enabling more comparison between authorities as well um, of the, the overall resource that is going into supporting pupils in Scottish schools. We know, of course... But it, it, does, it fundamentally does not tell us what resource is going into supporting pupils with additional support needs. That's one in four pupils. It is an acute problem that has been identified, including by this committee, and the published data no longer provides information on that, on how pupils with additional support needs are being supported in terms of staff numbers. I think the question of, of the resources going into uh, supporting people with additional support needs is, is a slightly different one. I think that's a, a question of trying to assess what resources provided by a range of staff in education systems uh, to uh, supporting kids with, with, with ASN, whether that be classroom teachers, whether it be other professionals from outside of the education department, whether it be support staff of some form or another, um, and actually trying to split out the proportion of time that individuals spend supporting pupils with additional support needs uh, would be a particularly difficult, onerous task. Um, I don't think that looking at the categories of support staff or specific um, teaching staff either is capable, either before or now, of telling you what the overall picture of resource going into supporting pupils with ASN specifically actually is. Um, I'm happy to hand over to other members at this point, Convener, but I'd be keen to come back in later on. <laughs> Okay, um, I, I've got a number of them. But just before we move on, Mr Wilson, I wonder if it would be possible if you could write to the committee just with um, your procedures about handling requests. It would sure. be um, helpful for um, deliberations going down the line. Um, can I bring in Miss Lamont first? Thank you very much. Can I ask just very specifically, first of all, who rate, you said um, that concerns about the stats were raised. Who raised the concerns? Was it the uh, Scottish Government that was raising concerns or was it the stat statisticians that were raising concerns about the quality of the stats? So these concerns were picked up as part of our initial uh, quality assurance procedures that we carried out on the data. And um, when we looked at this data and we discovered that there was um, some anomalies, that's when we decided to take, undertake further quality assurance processes. Um, on the library staff in particular, we um, responded to a parliamentary question um, which... Um, uh, we were then, it was then uh, raised with us that some of the information that was provided in that question uh, may not have been accurate. So again, we um, uh, returned to the, the data on that, on that question and uh, subsequently uh, issued a correction to that parliamentary question response. And I mean, I am not, I can't say the word statistician, so I cannot, you'll know that I am not one. Um, but is it normal practice when these, when the people are giving you poor information, do you simply generalise the information that you're seeking, which is what feels that's happened here, <coughs> is that local authorities are not giving you detailed enough information, and in response to that, or accurate enough response, which is allowing, is it resulted in you in saying something you felt wasn't justifiable professionally, um, and therefore you've generalised it. Can you think of any other example where you're gathering data that you've done that? Yeah, I mean, I can, I'm happy to, to answer that. I mean, that I think that's a professional judgment of the, of the statisticians about whether actually uh, the time spent um, trying to rectify or improve that situation uh, would be uh, would be value for, for money. Um, so I can think of um, situations around the economy or around I guess around all of our um, or our survey data. You know, we could survey more companies, we could survey more people. Uh, to get a more accurate picture of, of what's what's going on, but we have to take a judgment about what's good enough uh, in in those circumstances. So we we would report on uh, sort of relatively high levels of industrial classification, for example, because our, our surveys are only so big of business, and therefore their ability to drill down to to very specific uh, industry classifications or for um, for the, our labour market statistics, while it's a, a quite a big population survey, uh, we re report at relatively uh, sort of high levels of aggregation of um, job job titles because the, we can only go to so many people. The cost of going to more people uh, becomes prohibitively big, mm -hmm. and and I guess that this is a. But the other a side of the case. argument is that. You, you produce statistics that don't tell you anything. I mean, if, if I asked how many women are working in a particular field and you say, well, we're not getting a very good response, that will tell you how many people are there, it kind of misses the point. Can I ask, though, the, to, to, um, Laura Meikle from the Scottish Government's point of view? I mean, I, the statisticians have a, have a professional job to do. And quite rightly, it's already been said 
They describe the situation, they don't define it, yes. but it provides opportunity for debate. Yes. Now, John Swinney himself has said that he's pausing some of his response to us um, until he looks at discussions that are not included, not engaged, not involved. Yeah. And there are very profound issues in there about the kind of support a young person with autism has, yes. how much of the school day they're actually in school, whether yes. they're excluded inappropriately, whether they're taught with their peers. Yep. If you've got a situation where you can't even say how many young people with autism will have the support of an additional support needs professional, how can you possibly even begin to enter that debate? So I think and so I want, what I want you to tell me is, what did the Scottish Government officials say? Or, and John Swinney was very clear, it wasn't anything to do with him. When you were told you were going to produce these new categories, these generalised categories, what did the Scottish Government say? OK. So I think the one of the very important things to reflect on is that the statistics are a very important part of the evidence base that we use to implement policy, but it's not the only one. If um, it's an important one, it's yes. describing but not defining, and it's offering the opportunity for debate, which is what they see as their purpose. Absolutely. In what way can generalising the categories in this way help define yes. the debate. Absolutely. Um, so the, in terms of the specific question about the, the decision, um, the, we have an advisory group for additional support for learning, which has within it a, range of, a wide range of stakeholders for, involving children, young people, parents, service delivery um, people, um, a vast array, so that we capture the, the perspective of a range of people when we are thinking about our implementation. Um, we have had discussions in that arena around about data in a slightly different um, way than, than we're describing here in terms of this specific change. But the, the information comes through there about the fact that um, the, the term pupil support assistant is more appropriate. The, the question about the terminology of additional support needs auxiliary or classroom assistant has been raised in those types of arenas in, an, in my team's discussion with a wide range of stakeholders. Um, there's a, a concern about just a proper reflection. So when the, when the issue was raised about the fact that we join these two t um, categories together, um, I was comfortable with that decision because that was that has a, a link back to what our stakeholders. So you seriously um, saying that the stakeholders who are already seeing their children's description of their experience in school, of not having a full day in school, not being properly supported, no. the additional support needs that they're entitled to has been pulled with other young people. No. Are you seriously saying that they said to you, it's okay to generalise this? We'll, we'll rest, we'll leave policy on anecdote no. from this group rather than from the evidence underneath which would pin no. it, underpin any policy change. No, what I'm saying is that my discussions with um, education authorities, with COSLA, as part of those wider discussions with all of those stakeholders, um, led us to um, agree, be able to agree to that um, joining of those two categories together because the terminology which is used out there in the system is pupil support assistant predominantly. But, but you would accept and that families, um, campaigning groups have said their sense is that the teaching unions, people working as staff support themselves <coughs> are telling us that there's a lack of support in schools which is a burden on, on, on teachers, pressure on on um, the workforce more generally, they're saying all of these are things are happening, and say, so, well, government might say, well, it's not really as bad as that, local authorities might say it's not as bad as that. What we haven't got, where you would then go to is to the evidence base. Absolutely. And you have generalised the evidence. You cannot no. answer the question now. How Absolutely. many young people with additional support needs have somebody who's professionally trained to support them as opposed to generalised classroom support for which they would be given, they make some of that person's time? We can't answer that question I'm anymore. sorry, but what I started out to say is that the, the information from the statistics is one part of the of the wide that range one of part evidence. is no longer telling, yeah, answering the question. Let, let the witness um, okay. answer the question. In, in we use a wide context. range of information to um, consider the implementation of additional support for learning. That includes information from Education Scotland inspection, including information from parents and young people about their view about the support they receive in school. We engage specifically with um, particular stakeholders, for example, in relation to the 
um, the, the evidence that you referred to, we, we officials engage directly with the National Autistic Society, Scottish Autism and Children in Scotland, mm -hmm. to have a discussion about what the actions are that are needed to take place. We don't have to rely entirely on the statistical evidence in order to take action to improve implementation. And we routine, routinely do that. If you don't know what the picture is, how can... If you believe you're... Because in, we ask, because we ask believe, stakeholders to give us the yeah. information, a what, much broader range of information so and evidence that comes well, from statistics. The logic of that position is you wouldn't have, you wouldn't employ statisticians at all. No, you would simply ask people how they, f how they feel the thing's going. I mean, st I understand, you, I understand there's more to your job than looking at the stats. I respect that. But if people are saying the system is not working, one of the ways in which you can establish whether the system is working or not, if you can look at the evidence and say to families, actually, Absolutely. there is, is something different here. And the challenge is that the problem is in our schools we're being told that young people who need personal additional support needs professional working with them are now being part of a broader group of young people given broader classroom support. These two things are not the same and what people are fearful of is a consequence of that as is told by the National Autism Society with the report Scottish Autism and others is that young people are on part-time timetables are being excluded within the school estate or are not getting access to the same level of support as they might otherwise have expected. And you cannot even rebut that because you haven't got the evidence to do so. What I'm saying to you is we don't use the statistical evidence that we're talking about here today to, to try to address those issues. If you're talking about part-time timetabling or exclusion from school, we go and we talk to people directly about what are the underlying issues which cause that problem mm -hmm. in order to establish the actions we need to take mm -hmm. to resolve it. Can I just say to you that the, the uh, Not Engaged, Not Involved uh, report mm -hmm. is one of many. Enable Scotland did one yes. which talked about the experience of young people with learning um, needs in schools. Um, the, the National Association of School Teachers, Union of Women Teachers, NSUWT, yes. they also produced a report that said the same thing. And the way in which the Scottish Government would respond to that is to say, well, actually, the figures don't suggest that that's the scale of the problem. So. You, weren't, you didn't respond to the reports, the government didn't respond to the reports, but you can't now rely on those, on saying it's simply about that dialogue and that engagement. Do you understand? I do understand, frustration? but you, I think you are um, reflecting a, um, a position where each individual, re we respond to each individual report and we don't think about the collective um, evidence that comes forward from all of those. We would consider all of that information as part of our evidence about implementation. And test it against the statistical evidence, and which has been weakened. It, and test it against the views of our stakeholders, the large group that I talked about. Does this feel real to you? What are the actions we should take? It's, that is the ultimate question for us. It's not about... Um, we, we don't sit and challenge everybody's evidence. We don't rip those reports apart. What is it that we need to do is the question, and then we start to look at our implementation I wasn't requirements I was with our stakeholders. You can't argue on the one hand that these reports provide you with the evidence um, to, to respond to the problem and then say, but on the other hand, and we don't have to worry about the stats because we deal with that. These reports we are pushing all. back because government has said, no, actually, the scale of the problem is not something that we recognise. We use all of the information which is available to us as our evidence base in order to form our actions. Statistical information, mm -hmm. information from stakeholders, including all of those reports that you've referred to. We use Education Scotland information. We engage regularly with ADES and COSLA. There are specific groups looking at children and young people with additional support needs and, we ref and engage with the additional support for learning officers. To, in order to ensure that we have a range of information at a number of different levels within the system in order to inform our policy decisions. We don't rely on any single piece of evidence at any single piece of time. It's, it's about a holistic you know, But you are content to have less information from the statistical side. You are content for it to be more generalised. Yes, I'm going to bring in Mr Wilson. I, I think just on, on that, the specifics about, about the data in relation to that, I, I mean, I don't accept that we have less information. I think there's a premise behind the question that you ask that you know the, the, the titles or the categories that we had before were a adequate description of what those members of staff what what those what that collection does is co is counts members of staff um, with uh, various uh, job titles or, or rules what it doesn't do as I said earlier is 
uh, account for their time and what they do in terms of supporting individual uh, pupils within a, a classroom or a school setting or in terms of providing broader support to a classroom teacher, nor do we account for the time that individual classroom teachers spend supporting, directly spend supporting addition, pupils with additional support needs. That's a very different exercise and is, is the job titles or, or the rules that we collect as part of this administrative data uplift. As I said earlier, I, I don't think that's, that's the right way to answer the specific question that you ask about the amount of support that pupils with additional support needs in schools receive. The, the purpose is of, the, of the question is we need to know that in order to make sure the need is being met. I don't blame you if you've been, you find it difficult to collect that and you have to make a judgment call. You wouldn't, under any set of circumstances, go into a secondary school and just say, I'm going to tell us how many teachers are here. If you want to know, for example, the capacity to teach science in a secondary school, you'll need to know how many science teachers there are. So why would it be any different? And it's not, maybe it's, you're operating within a policy framework which is not decided by you. I accept that. You have, the Scottish Government has said there isn't really, they don't want to disaggregate that information. They don't feel it's useful. That you could, it could be disaggregated, but it's not necessary. You don't have to do it. You feel there's no obligation in policy terms for you to do it now. I, mean, I think there's a, the, we need to separate slightly the, the statistical nomenclature that we use for these sorts of things from uh, employment practice and, and practice within, within schools. Um, what we can do is uh, try, through the statistical collection, to uh, reflect as accurately as we can practice within, within local authorities, within schools, to reflect the specific rules and responsibilities and the job titles that people have within the system. What we've learned through this exercise is that the ones that we had before, particularly the, the, the two that we're, we're here to talk about in particular, um, no longer reflected accurately how support staff um, functioned within schools because of the rules that, that they give. You mentioned teachers, uh, science teachers, for example. You, you're quite right. We, we, we don't simply go to schools and say, how many teachers have you got? We have a very um, detailed, long-established process for collecting the number of teachers on a given day. Uh, in, in September in, in the system, and yes, we collect information about the primary subject that they teach, so their main, their main subject, so if they're a physics teacher or a maths teacher, then we collect that information. Um, we don't, though, collect information about everything that that teacher does and how they spend all of their time in schools. They will, no doubt, undertake other duties which are not directly related to teaching their, their primary subject because that's a very different statistical collection exercise. With respect, you make my point for me because there is a difference between a classroom support teach, uh, assistant and an additional support needs professional. And we must, if, we, if we're capable of, of distinguishing between um, a physics teacher and a history teacher, we should be able to distinguish between those two as well. We need to distinguish between those two, frankly, if we're going to make sure that the whole needs within a classroom are met. So I think, sorry, um, the, the reflection that I talked about in terms of our discussion with education authorities is that, in fact, those two things are not as distinct as they have been previously, and that there has been a move to... Um, the, the use of a, a role called a pupil support assistant, which actually merges two of those functions. Why that's happening. And it's not because it's driven by the needs of uh, children with additional support needs. It's been driven by the pressures inside the school and in terms of budgets that they're pooling and sharing the resource of a classroom support assistant as opposed to having additional support needs support directed to an individual young person which relates to their um, support plan. That's, that's what parents tell us. That so actually somebody who's supposed to be identified for the needs of one young person in a class will very often be pulled across a classroom now. You can understand why the school is doing it because of the, of the pressures on their budgets. It doesn't make it right. And then to, to, to have the, the stats to follow a decision which has been driven by budgets, to me, creates a problem in terms of ensuring we actually understand what's going on inside our schools in support for young people with additional support needs. I, I think my, my position is different to yours. I, I think that the um, that the, the fact that, that in my discussions with education authorities, um, when we've been discussing this role, there is discomfort that the fact that those um, those two roles are, are described in that way when practice out in authorities is that there is a, a different terminology being used and we should reflect that. Um, that was, that was the, the basis upon which the discussion we had and the decision we had was made. Um, it went no further than so that. You, you've come across families then with a young person with additional support needs who's been identified as needing individual support who have said it's entirely acceptable that that support that's come into the classroom to support them specifically 
should be pulled across the whole classroom and, and the person called a pupil support assistant. You're comfortable with that in terms of policy? I cannot comment on the way in which education authorities deploy their resource. That is a matter entirely for the education authority. Scottish Government doesn't policy, have a view? In terms of policy, the requirement on education authorities is to identify, to provide for and to review the additional support needs of the pupils within that authority and that that um, provision and support should be tailored to the, in the needs of the individual child. That is our position, um, th and is in which is enshrined in law. Um, it's for education authorities to decide how they, how they resource that requirement upon them. Mm. It feels we're now in a position where if we don't ask, we don't know. And that's where we've got in terms of this tax. Okay. I, I'm going to move on. I've got a number of members that have indicated a supplementary at this stage. Um, so if you could keep it to quick supplementary, Mr MacDonald. A few quick points about quality of data. Um, in order to be ensure we've got the correct level of support in place, we have to have accurate numbers about uh, the number of young people requiring additional support needs. And comparing the first bulletin that came out with the last one that's been published, the school roles increased by 2.3%, but the number of pupils requiring additional support needs has increased from just over 10% to 27 per cent in an eight-year period. Is there a reason for that substantial increase? Have you got any quality about the, uh, the quality of the data or has the methodology changed or what's happened? So the, the um, prior to 2010, um, the data collection around additional support for learning focused on the children and young people who were learning in special schools and those who had um, a formal plan, so a coordinated support plan, an individualised educational programme, yeah. um, or some other plan. And that's a very, very narrow um, group of children and young people. So in 2010, we changed the statistical collection um, to instead collect anyone who is receiving um, any type of support, whether that be within a formal plan, out with a formal plan, regardless of the education setting that the um, learning and therefore as a result of that collection in 2010, change in 2010, there was a sharp increase in the number of children and young people re recorded as having additional support needs in 2011 and 2012. Um, the data stabilised um, more in the sort of 2012 um, time frame. So that we have, a f in effect, we have a five year period of run of information which is broadly consistent but the the actual increase the sharp increase is caused because we've expanded the collect the number of children and young people we collect but in 2013 it was 131,000 pupils yeah, that's it's right. now 183,000 yeah. pupils yes yeah. so, so there has been increasing. a continued increase yes absolutely yeah. children are continuing to be identified as having additional support needs and we are continuing to record that information so, so the picture is rising so looking at looking at the d different categories you you mentioned coordinated support plan yes comparing 2010 to 2017 has been a 37 percent reduction individualized education program there's been a 19 percent reduction yep. yet the category other has increased fivefold so there and there has also been a significant increase in the number of children young people who have children child's plans so there's another there's another planning yeah, mechanism is, yeah. in there yeah. so the, it's a it's it's a balancing out rather than a than a, a whole reduction there, there's a, a spread um, of different planning mechanisms used. So, so given that other now makes up 78% of the pupils yep. who are on additional support needs, yeah. is there a need for more categories to make sure that level of support is targeted properly? I th well, the, the, in practice, the support will be targeted properly. Um, it's the, 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 the other category contains all the plans um, which are not one of the other names. So, for example, um, education authorities may use something called an additional support plan. Um, for me, that would be an individualised educational programme, but they may not use that category when they respond to the collection because it doesn't exactly match. And so, therefore, they would use the other category for that. So the, the, the personalisation of support and the planning of support is there. It's just that the actual title of the plan isn't there in terms of data collection. But that allows us to collect um, information about a very broad range of um, different uh, planning approaches. Um, within our collection, rather than not have the information available at all. So the level of detail that will be in future stats bulletins for education carry more categories in it? That's not the, the intention at the moment, no. I think it's, it's worth adding that out, out with those who, who are in receipt of a specific plan, we also collect data on 
um, the the reason for additional support needs uh, for the individual. So whether it be um, because of um, mobility issues or whether it be autism or, or whether we collect information on on the reason for that as well. That they, most of those pupils live uh, in a, in the group which is outside of those those formalised plans. So we do have that level of detail, and currently we don't have a. Uh, a plan to, to change that, that list or that method for collecting those, those pieces of information. Okay. Okay. C can I ju just ask Mr. Wilson, just for absolute clarity, mm -hmm. that the reason the reason for bringing it together is that the, the individual categories weren't consistent. Um, um, does that mean that the we, when you get the breakdown, the additional breakdown, there could still be two different councils reporting ASN? as a category, but having completely different support levels for that job? No. Uh, is that a question about the pupils' data or about the staff data? Sorry. About the staff data and ESN. And um, at the level of so at the level of data that detail that we collect the data, so the the ASN auxiliaries and the the, the kind of care categories that we had before, um, we we think that is that is the case. We think that we are, there are because those descriptions don't match anymore with you know the, the staff that they have in place. That we know, for example, that some authorities, because there's not an option on the collection which says people support assistant, which is what they call their staff, that they were kind of randomly in some cases allocating those people to one of those one of those categories so so yes i think at that level of detail there is effectively a difference uh, between authorities who may have individual staff members doing precisely the same job in, in a school um, who've recorded them against asn auxiliaries because they think that's perhaps the closest fit or it's what they've done in the past um, and another authority who who records them all against something else um because they think that's a closer fit or because it you know because they're just unable to make that, that differentiation between the two, which leads to the decision to amalgamate those two things for publication purposes, but not for, for collection purposes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mr. Mandel, you wanted a quick supplementary? <coughs> so, just to go back, convener, to uh, the answers to uh, Joanne Lamont, um, I just wondered if I'm understanding it correctly. In effect, you know, from a Scottish Government point of view, do you just no longer, from a policy point of view, see a distinction between those two roles? The or you don't think that the difference is significant? No, I th well, I think that the roles are determined by the education authority. They're not determined by us. Um, but you must have a view from a policy point of view as to whether or not the distinction is significant. Because like, like parliamentarians, you know, I would imagine that the government's looking at the performance of local authorities in this area and wanting to compare practice, find best practice, support the work of... Education Scotland, etc. So we recognise that that there are a number of different roles. Um, but do you think the distinction is important? I, I will answer the question. Okay. <laughs> um, there are a number of different roles. Um, so there are um, pupil support staff, behaviour support staff, homeschool link workers, school nurses, um, medical professionals, educational psychologists, classroom assistants, and additional support needs auxiliaries. Some authorities do use those two specific categories, but the majority of them ha use uh, the, the term pupil support assistant to describe the functions which may, be, which may have formally been um, called a classroom assistant or it may formally have been called additional support needs assistant. The, the way that in which the authority uses the resource is de determined by the support that they need to give the individual children and young people within the classroom. It's not determined by yes. me it's not determined by our policy specifically. The Additional Support for Learning Act requires that the provision is made to the individual child. So it's still not really an answer to whether you see a distinction between... Do, does the government see a distinction? Does it see those as two distinct and different roles within a classroom? I, what I'm saying to you is I recognise that there's a number of roles in a classroom. No, but between those... T I'm, I'm, I'm talking and about there, ASN and auxiliaries and, cla and classroom support. Do you think those are two different and distinct roles? Or do you think that the difference between them doesn't matter? I think that in the past they have been very distinct roles. I think currently practice is that they are not as distinct as they have been in, the, in previously. OK. No, thank you. OK. Thank you. Uh, Ms Mackay, you wanted to... Yes, thank you. Yes. Um, good morning. Can I just start? I mean, I've never been good at statistics. I'm now completely bamboozled by all the different categories you've been talking about. Um, so is there a need then for clearer instructions uh, to go out to authorities about how to make the distinction, this very important distinction, in your opinion? I think it's, it, it's back to a point that we made earlier, and that there's a, there's a difference between... We have to separate this into two parts. One is 
providing sufficient guidance to local authorities and granted to schools directly on how they complete the statistical return. So we, we did, for example, discover some um, effectively errors within the returns in, as part of the, this process where they simply hadn't um, uh, followed the guidance correctly and recorded the wrong piece of information. Sorry, can in I the stop you? Place. The guidance that's going out, does it make the distinction clear? You know, Between between support staff in general and additional support needs pupils? No, and I think that's that, that's that's what I was getting at by way of my opening remarks, and that that's not an issue that should be determined by a statistical collection. The statistical collection should reflect the practice uh, implemented in the system. So it's for the system to tell us what the distinction is and what the rules are that they have in place, and for us to then try and accommodate that as best as we can in a statistical collection, rather than to say... Um, you know, we have these specific job titles or specific categories in mind for the collection, and this is what they mean to us. You need to sort out your staff returns so that they match into those. So I think. It so who gives that guidance then? I mean, who actually tries to make that distinction? In terms of the rules you know, to, that people yeah. have in schools, that's a matter for that's a matter for local authorities. That's the employer. The, the local the local authority, as the employer, determines what the rules are that are carried out by their staff under each of those um, different. Titles. But I'm asking who's giving guidance to local authorities. Should that come from no, that's just, it's, from the government? Well, or? It's not appropriate that, that we determine that um, f as from the Scottish I government. I understand that, but who, who, who would give that guidance when it's so, so important? But it's for the education authority themselves to decide what the roles are of their employees. It's not, it's not for, you know, it's for them to guide themselves as to what the roles are in, respond in responding to children and young people's needs. They, when you know when roles are advertised, they're advertised in specific schools or in you know specific um, specific um, establishments, and they have attached to them a series of functions that that person will carry out under whatever title they are. At the moment, when they, a number of titles are used, um, even beyond the ones that we've discussed. Can I just ask the sent out. Is there any guidance issued with it? Yes, there is. Uh, the um, the uh, we have a, a specification that is uh, publicly available on the Scottish Government website that all local authorities will use uh, when they're um, deciding how to uh, categorise and, and assign their staff uh, to the categories that we collect information on. Okay, thank you, Rona. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay, I'm not really any clearer in that, but can I ask um, Mr. Halliday if I picked you up correctly, you said that um, to extrapolate that information would co uh, be too much work and would not be value for money. I wonder if you could expand on that, please. Um, I guess that what I, the point I was making is uh, in whatever statistics we produce, uh, we've got to um, do it in a way that is, is value for money. And we've got to take a judgment on uh, how much effort to spend in making sure um, everything about that particular data set is um, absolutely right um, versus uh, making sure that um, the, the, the vast majority of it um, is, is so. And I guess that, as, as Mick uh, said earlier on, that this is, forms part of a... Uh, a, sort of a, a wider data collection or set of data collections a, about schools and about pupils and uh, th that I guess um, uh, Alistair and, and his team are, um, are taking that judgment about uh, whether to go back and back and back to, to local authorities uh, on the basis that uh, actually practice within local authorities is, uh, is, is clearly... Um, sort of different and, and mixed um, so. yeah um, I'm struggling to understand how producing data that is general and doesn't actually tell tell people the information or the government the information that they need um, is value for money I, I, I don't see the point of that I think there's a, it, again it's, it's back to the, a couple of the, the answers that we've given already in, in terms of what those data are, are for um, there's two potential exercises uh, there. One is this question of whether we, now that we've, we, we've kind of alighted on this pupil support assistant category, whether we can retrospectively go back and, and, and create a pupil support assistant um, time series, if you like, um, 
for those data. What, what we've learned from discussions with, with local authorities is, is that that would be extremely difficult. Um, for them, it would be very difficult for them to, to go back and, and kind of pinpoint when, as Laura was suggesting, they moved uh, from a particular job title or when the rules sufficiently changed. That's one aspect. The other aspect is to look at, again, this issue of you know how staff spend their time rather than what staff you have got. Um, and that would be an incredibly difficult exercise for anybody to undertake, any organisation, whether that's a school or a local authority, or the government itself or anybody else, to try and assign the specific time of individuals who have necessarily broad remits uh, to specific tasks or actions would be would be incredibly difficult, and I, I would question whether that was was, so was worth the resources to put in. Priorities don't come into it then. You don't consider it to be a priority. Well, I, I would say that uh, that we have in the statistical community in Scotland um, processes in place to listen to the needs or to identify and listen to the needs of, of users. Uh, of those statistics and then to I guess to also make a judgment about um, how we best marshal our resources to, to meet those needs and that might be through uh, adjusting um, a survey such as, as this it might be about collecting information in, in a different way um, so I'm just sort of picking up uh, from this conversation a sort of different set of needs than than perhaps you know, we, we've been getting from, from local authorities uh, and from others. And I guess the, the question for us is how we factor those, the things that you're telling us into uh, planning future uh, collections of data uh, and whether, whether there would need to be some other way of, uh, of getting at the information that you're describing. N not necessarily uh, that would be by adjusting this collection because we could kind of spend ages trying to do trying to think about how we do that, but actually practices, it makes that um, quite difficult in the format that we're, we're, in the way that the data collection is already set up. And I, I think the consequent demand on, sorry, the consequent demand on um, on local authorities' time to try and undertake an exercise like that would be, you know, a very serious ask. Um, and we would need to balance that off against against the quality of the information that we were likely to get as, as part of that process. And that's why, when Laura was, was speaking earlier about the kind of wider range of information and, and, and evidence that, that we can bring to these sorts of discussions, uh, it becomes really important because there, there may well be uh, other more appropriate ways of collecting the type of the type of information that I think you're, you're getting at, rather than through adjusting a, a formalised uh, administrative data collection exercise. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm still on supplementaries, but Mr. Gray. Come back to the point Laura made about um, these roles being a matter for the education authorities and local authorities as employers. So if you went to the local authority and asked to count teachers, and they said, we don't call them teachers anymore, so we don't have any, that would be okay? No, no, I, I don't think that's what I was saying. Um, what we are, what we in taking this decision, what we were trying to do was, in effect, to um, try to align the, the data that we have more closely to the practice um, that is that's out there in the education system. No, but system. That's, that's not the point, really, is it? The point is this. The Scottish Government say to local authorities, you must employ a certain number of teachers. Yes. In fact, if you fail to, we will claw back money from you. Why, why is it therefore acceptable when it comes to pupils with additional support needs to say, we're not even going to count the support that you give them? That, I think it's unfair to say that we don't count the support that is given to them. We have a statistical collection and yeah, we have worthless. a range of other evidence. Well, it's not but hang on, we've been told that the, the statistics which have been collected do not tell us how much support is being provided because pupil support assistants do other things as well so it's not being counted if if we were uh, the, t the example that you used of a teacher every single teacher in scotland provides some support to children and young people in order to collect that and try and provide the range of the data and the level of detail that you are seeking we would have to apportion a part of a teacher's time to every to, to one of these collections we would not manage to count that we but that, but that's it. nonsense because what is what is asked for is additional support, 
a support above and beyond what is being provided by the classroom practitioner in the classroom. That is what people assume counting additional support in a classroom is. But, but what we're being told is that authorities say, well, we don't really deliver it that way. And the government's response is, well, that's fine. So the, the point that you've made about the additionality, um, the support provided to an individual pupil, which is not provided to the rest of the class, would be considered to be additional because it is additional to that provided elsewhere. So it would be a portion of that person's time that we would require to count. We can't count that level of detail. It's not possible. What we can do is what we have done, which is to collect a range of information which gives us a baseline of information from which to work. We also, as I've said already, rely on a far wider range of information to inform our policy decisions. We, we work with a range of people in order to inform our positions on policy. It isn't simply about these statistics. They so, are important, so but they are not they So are my, not colleague, the only my colleague sitting next to me has just shown me a live uh, job uh, advert in my constituency in Knox Acad Academy in Haddington for an ASN auxiliary. Yeah. That is manifestly a member of staff being recruited uh, to provide additional support. Yes. All, all the committee is saying is, why won't the Scottish Government count those employees? And you're saying, because the education authorities say we're not going to tell you. You don't no. accept that true. for teachers. No, no that's not true. That's Sorry. Not what we said. Can I, I just in here, um, teachers are a specific category. It's a profession and it's a recognised role. Is this role the same across local authorities for additional support? Could an additional sports auxiliary be doing different roles in different authorities? Yes. Yes. Mr. Gay, do you want to come back in? Thank you. Um, I'm going to go to uh, Liz Smith. Thank you, Convener. Um, in previous uh, sessions of this committee in the last two years, we've taken a lot of evidence on a whole uh, range of educational issues, and we've had in front of us people like the OECD, uh, like the Royal Society of Edinburgh, like Professor Lindsay Patterson, like Keir Bloomer, uh, all of whom have raised questions about how effective is the data that is being collected about Scottish schools. And this morning seems to flag up very considerable concerns about how effective it is on one specific issue. Could I ask you how effective you think the data collection is on all educational issues? Because we have had concerns raised about this um, through the curriculum for excellence, through additional support for uh, learning, through a whole range of issues. Are you content that the way in which we are collecting data which is obviously absolutely crucial to inform policy, is as accurate and as comprehensive as it should be. I'm content that we have taken the correct steps to make sure that the data that we have is as accurate as it should be, that within the confines and the limits of the data collections that, that, that we undertake, they all, have, they all have limits and restrictions necessarily. We've talked about some of those already, specifically in relation to support staff. Um, the issue with data, and I'm familiar with, with some of the issues that, that, that you talked about, um, relates to a range of things. It would take us a long time to go through all of those, but the, the range of data that we have across Scottish education, I think, is very comprehensive. I think it's very detailed. We have vast amounts of information about the mechanics of the system, so schools, pupils, teachers and other, and other staff. We have huge amounts of information on the performance of pupils and of the system uh, itself. We, we, we take in all of the data that the Scottish Qualifications Authority um, produce every year in terms of the exam results. We, we, we have all of that. We have data from um, Skills Development Scotland about outcomes from pupils at the end of the school process. We have the new collection looking at the achievement of curriculum for excellence levels throughout the broad general education uh, phase, of uh, which lines us up with the National Improvement Framework uh, and other things. Um, there are always questions about a system, whether it's education or anything else, uh, so, that the data that we have can't answer. So, uh, just to interrupt you, Mr Wilson, would you, would you have an answer as to why you think that uh, these uh, individuals, in some cases these uh, groups, who have very strong pedigrees in educational research and data collection themselves, are raising serious questions 
and whether, had they been watching this session this morning, when, in my view, and I think the view of several colleagues, um, has raised very serious issues about this particular issue, why, why do they have these concerns if you are telling us that everything uh, is as good as it could be? Uh, I don't think that's what I said. Um, I think I said quite clearly that there is always limits to the data that we have. There was always questions that we, we might want evidence for, which are not um, answerable through a, a data collection exercise. They may be answerable through other exercises like evaluations or research or surveys or uh, discussions with stakeholders in the way that Laura uh, described, uh, described earlier. Um, some of the concerns uh, raised externally about information on Scottish education relate to how we use the information rather than the information that we have. Uh, some of them relate to uh, the type of questions that we're asking uh, in, terms of, in terms of the data that, that, that we have rather than the, the scope of the collection. Some of them um, relate to a desire to maintain what are now historical collections uh, on, on the system, um, whether that be the, the SSLN, which comes up from time to time, or some of the, the, the school leaver surveys that used to be undertaken. Um, so those, those views come from a range of perspectives, depending on the use that they want to put that so, information so to. Can, can I ask you, Mr Wilson, objectively, what would you like to see uh, improved in terms of the data collection, in terms of the questions? You've just said that you don't think questions are always uh, the ones that perhaps people might want to have answered. What, what do you need to uh, have as an improvement to ensure that the data that we are provided with as politicians um, is better able to inform policy making? I think there are, I mean, the first thing is to make sure that we, we keep pace with, with the system, to make sure that the data collections that we have match what happens in, in, in the system. And do they not just now? Well, I think, I think we've done our best to make sure that they do, but it's, it's the, the questions coming from, from this room suggest that other people are not necessarily content with us doing that. Um, I, I think there are some broader developments in terms of data and how we use data as, as government that would increase the power of the information that we have. I think our ability to uh, match data sets together, which we now have a much more uh, a much clearer basis uh, to do. Some, some legislative uh, changes have enabled us to look at the, the potential for matching information across systems together, where we have the ability to match individual uh, information. So looking at uh, people's uh, attainment records in schools and matching it to their subsequent employment patterns and earnings potential, for example, is a particularly powerful uh, um, piece of information that at the moment we, we, we can't directly answer through data collections, we can try it through other things but not, not through data. Um, and I think um, questions around the impact of particular uh, measures, policies, programmes, um, approaches to delivering education are always a, a good question. As a, um, I, I'm not a statistician by profession, I'm an economist, I have a, a broader interest in, um, in kind of evaluative and performance, performance information, so evaluation questions about the performance of particular interventions are always of interest. Now, they are not things that are generally answerable purely through data collection exercises. They require further exercises, surveys, research, more, okay. uh, whether it's... My, my final point is, would, would you agree, though, from exactly what you've just said, that for your work uh, to interpret the information um, is very dependent, an accurate interpretation is very dependent on the data collection itself, that the facts have to be there in both a qualitative and quantitative uh, basis for you to be able to make an accurate interpretation. Would you accept that? Uh, yes. Okay. okay, I'm going to go to Dr Allen. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Just uh, really a question about, um, if, if you like, the borderline between what's considered to be official statistics and what's considered to be background data to official statistics and how that, that line is drawn. The reason I mention it is because the committee's taken an interest specifically in recent weeks in instrumental tuition in schools, for instance. So am I right in saying that some of the statistics around music tutors in schools would be considered as background data or would they be considered within the scope of official statistics? I can, I mean, I'd, I can say something about the general um, case and then perhaps uh, leave my colleagues to talk about the specifics of the uh, music tuition. So I guess that my role as the chief statistician for for Scotland is uh, to make sure that uh, to, to raise the quality of our statistics so that we uh, can produce trustworthy, high quality numbers that support decision making. And that I guess that I take a decision on those things 
in relation to whether something is official statistic or whether it doesn't meet that standard. And I think we've got strong processes across our teams about uh, making sure that our statistics are trustworthy. Um, we've got uh, good processes to, to make sure that our, um, our statistics have, have value. And so it gets, for, for across the piece. So it comes down to judgments about the individual quali the quality of individual data collections. And that's really about our understanding of the whole statistical chain from uh, where that where that data is first recorded and, and then how that, um, so essentially what happens at that point and then what happens uh, to try and refine and to uh, assure ourselves of the quality of that information by the time it uh, arrives with, with our statistical colleagues uh, and when th th that's published in a way that allows uh, the users of the statistics to properly understand and interpret and to use that information. So that, I guess that, that's, that's my general approach and I'll maybe just leave the colleagues to talk about this particular case. So in terms of the uh, music instructors in particular, uh, in previous years that data has been released as uh, uh, supplementary uh, statistics to the main headline statistics that were released in December. Um, for the 2017 data, uh, based on the information we received from our quality assurance processes, uh, as well as the kind of changing context and environment into which we're releasing this data, we took the decision to uh, only release certain categories as, as um, background statistics and the rest of the information we made available as management information. Uh, that was a, a, an interim position while um, we considered the, the most appropriate way to uh, make that data publicly available and, and serve the, the need and demand for that information. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Ruth, you wanted on this? Yeah. Very briefly, um, it's just a point around quality assurance because um, Alison Anthony said earlier on that people support assistant is what is used in schools. Um, I used to work previously as a teacher and in 2014, Edinburgh Council had a policy whereby we had classroom assistants which provided administrative support to principal teachers every two weeks, for example. They would come to my department and they would help with data entry, things like that. Um, that role, classroom assistant in Edinburgh, was very different to what it was in Fife when I worked there. So when I went to work in Fife, classroom assistant, it meant somebody in the class supporting the class or providing people support. How do you quality sure that people that are not PSAs don't end up in that category? Uh, so, uh, to a certain extent, we rely on what the local authorities are telling us about, uh, you know, how they, they're the ones that are categorising staff and, and, and putting them into certain categories. Um, and that information will be based on, on how they are advertising those roles and, and the types of roles that they are uh, uh, describing and, and using in, in the schools. And uh, the information that we'll take on board when we're doing our quality assurances, we'll look at um, how that information has changed over years, how it compares to other local authorities, how it compares between schools within a local authority, and, and we'll seek to kind of draw together some kind of uh, coherent picture of how those categories are um, being implemented. And it's through that work that we've taken the decision to present the data for ASN auxiliaries and uh, classroom assistants under this new category of people support assistants. So what I'm saying to you is the same job can mean very different things in two different parts of the country. Yes. Do you check then that what you're actually gathering is the right data? To the extent that we undertake specific examinations of whether an individual member of staff is performing particular roles within a school, we don't do that. That would be a that would be something else. That would almost be an audit of the of, of the employment practices of, of the authority rather than anything else. The guidance that we issue describes the kind of thing that, that we we have that's in scope for the data collection. Um, so um, volunteer parents who are supporting pupils within classrooms, for example, are excluded from scope. We don't count them, so we, we, we are clear with local authorities that they can't be assigned to one of the uh, staff categories, for example. Um, but as Alistair says, it, to, to an extent, we are reliant on uh, local authorities providing us with, with the correct information about the way that they use their, their staff. Okay, thank you. C can I just ask about the, the background data um, with regards to school technicians? 
Um, the committee is about to undertake some work in relation to um, the STEM strategy of the Scottish Government and um, there have been articles in TESS as recently as July 2018 talking about um, the reduction in school technicians um, by nearly 500 since 2005. Is the situation for lab technicians, school technicians the same as pupil support and that there are different roles across different schools and the nature of those roles are changing? So uh, we haven't take, undertaken any specific uh, additional quality assurance on lab technicians, uh, or uh, oh, sorry, on technicians and laboratory assistants, uh, which is why we've, we've um, made that information available separately as management information at this stage. Um, when we come to look at that information in more detail, that's when we'll be able to uh, make an assessment as to how we think those, so how we think those categories are uh, being implemented by local authorities. Okay, um, can I ask a further? Um, there, there are um, school technician roles advertised as term time only, and some local authorities will be employing people full time. And obviously, it's a role that involves a significant amount of repair, preparation, and things. So, a full time role would be di different in one authority to another. Do you capture that in any way? Yeah, we do have information and guidance that we've uh, made available to local authorities on how they should be uh, calculating a full-time equivalent. Uh, and that takes account of um, uh, roles that only involve uh, term-time working and those that are um, work throughout the year. Okay. And uh, in, in both sort of technician roles and in um, people support roles, is, is there any... Um, categorization of the professional qualifications of the person doing that role from the data collection? That, that's something that's that's uh, left up to the local authorities to determine um, if the person they have is, is a technician, then, then that's how we would uh, expect them to be recorded as a technician, if that's what the local authority would describe them as. Thank you. Um, can it move on to um, Mr Scott, you wanted to come in? Yeah, uh, thanks. Um, Mr Haldy, I'm going to assume you're in charge of statistics across the whole government. Um, when you make a significant change to how statistics are being collected, how do you tell the world you're doing that? So we have a, a process called um, our, our ScotStat network. So this is a network of uh, a few thousand uh, users of our statistics. And we have uh, a series of themed groups uh, and so uh, school education would, would be one. And the, so all the, so first of all, there's a, there's a consultation um, that, would, that would happen with that group and that's partly online and it will partly be a face-to-face -face that we then, uh, I guess it depend on the individual, um, individual process. So- Did all this happen with this example where I've been discussing all morning on ASN? Um, this merger of the two categories into one. Did, did the process you're describing happen with this? So I'll, I'll perhaps uh, leave my, my colleague to talk about this specific example. Uh, so the first thing I'd just like to clarify is that we haven't made any changes to the data that's been collected. That's, that's, those categories that are collected from local authorities are the same as they have been for a number of years. The change that has been made is to the presentation of the data. Um, when we presented this data, we uh, uh, highlighted that there had been additional quality assurance undertaken uh, on uh, the data that we were publishing and that uh, the rest of the information was available uh, on request. But you didn't make an explanation, you didn't put out an explanation as to why you made the change in presentation, did so, you? So uh, that's, that's something that, that based on feedback we've had um, from here and from other places, uh, I think we'd, we'd want to make an improvement on yeah. for the next time that we uh, publish the data. Yeah, because we couldn't find any minutes or anything or anything explained why the presentation changed. So you accept that wasn't good? I think we, we, we could have uh, made it more explicit to users uh, that we'd uh, combined the uh, classroom assistant and AOX yeah. auxiliary okay. categories. No, that's fine. So can I take it, Mr. Halley, in future? I mean, this is a judgment, of course, but in a policy area where a parliamentary committee has been poring over ASN, you make a statistical change to the presentation of the information. Someone at some, in some part of your organisation has got to say, wait a minute, there's going to be a lot of parliamentary interest in this and we should make it clear as to why we're going to change the presentation of that information. It could be the same for the econom economic statistics, could be for anything. I expect that yeah. from, from It didn't comments. happen here, so that's got to change, obviously. 
just to, just to clarify, I mean, I, I think what we're talking about, the change that we're talking about in terms of the support staff is a reactive change to issues that were unearthed during the quality assurance process. Um, so we can't tell people what we're going to do about that until we've gone through the process of working out what the issue is and, and what the, the correct solution to that is. That's different to a planned change that we might make, and we, we do make those. We make planned changes to collections. We, we stop a collection, we change the timing of it, we change the methodology or whatever. Some of those require us to either for official statistics purposes or for, for broader legislative purposes to consult more broadly on yeah. bigger changes to the collections the that we do. Yeah. But this is this is a slightly different yeah. case okay. and, and I think we did put out information okay. no, at the time about, the, about um, the change. The other one I wanted to ask was a point you made earlier on to, to Ross Greer. Um, are you seriously saying that you treat every request for information as FOI? Is that a, a matter of government policy? So I would say that we treated um, Non-straightforward um, request non for information. Well, ones that aren't uh, trivial to, to to answer. Uh, if we have, if you know, it's it's about the amount of time that's that's taken to uh, to, to respond to to those questions. Oh, the, the amount of effort that's uh, that's taken to respond to those questions. So the criteria you're using is how long it's going to take part of your statistical unit to respond to the question, which determines whether it's going to be treated under FY or just or you'll just provide information. I guess that's that's what standard practice is, yeah. Mr Scott, I think um, the FY legislation put specific um, responsibilities on to any yeah, government bodies that's affected by I know that. I know that. I'm asking about the culture. Yeah, okay. Yes, I understand that, but I think um, it's a more general question that perhaps we, the committee could explore across government to get some of the information. Well, he is the head of statistics, the, convener. Yes, uh -huh. so and he's given the answer for the head at. of statistics, but I think it's a wider issue that we can, as a committee, okay, we can Can I ask explore. my final couple of questions? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, the, the changes that you're contemplating and will help us with understanding the presentation of your figures uh, in future, can you make sure the committee understands that that will now be in place from now on? And the process by which that will happen or across important policy areas will understand who makes that call? Well, that's, that's what I would expect of, uh, uh, of our colleagues to be, uh, to be able to, uh, as part of our publications, describe changes that, that have happened to the, either the data collection um, or significant changes to the presentation, not necessarily every single no. minutiae sure. of that. Yes. I think, as we've said a, a couple of times throughout this, you know, the, the, the landscape shifts regularly in terms of the interest in particular pieces of information. We collect an awful lot of data. Some of it is of particular interest to a minority of, of people. Some of it of uh, stays like that throughout its life. Uh, some of it doesn't. I think this probably falls into the, the category of one that's, that's kind of come up the, the level of interest mm -hmm. tables a little bit in, in recent years. When we make substantial changes to any of our data collections, of course, when we know, if we know in advance, we will we'll let the relevant people know about that, and, and that certainly is what we'll do if, when we've been through this process uh, to look at the, the, the kind of support staff categories that we've got. If we end up uh, looking at uh, substantive changes to that, we'll, we'll make sure that the broadest range of people, including yourselves, are aware of that. No, I appreciate that. And given how important and relevant education policy is, public policy and education sphere is at the moment, it's obviously extremely topical by definition. Do you, take, do you pay particular attention to how education statistics are being presented? Uh, yes, I mean, effectively, that's that's our job, to, to do that. that. That's what we're, we're there for. Um, the, the increased interest in this information is a bit of a double-edged thing for us. It's great because it means our our data is in, in the spotlight and it means we can we can bring it to bear in terms of the debates and the evidence that we have. But as I said earlier, it brings a, a responsibility to make sure that it's fit for purpose and, and keeps pace with, with practice within the system as well. So, yeah. So therefore, you understand why it's a bit difficult for us yeah. to understand why Ross Greer didn't get... Didn't, didn't have that information provided, given it was uh, it was a matter of such interest to this committee and indeed to a wider public policy sphere. I'm not clear which information you think he wasn't provided well, with. I mean, we answered his question okay. given well, the we've data. Been through so. it for an hour all morning. I'm not going to go over it again. <laughs> Can I? Sorry, could I add one further thing to the to the to the point about um, future collection of data, particularly in relation to additional support for learning, um, which is that um, the. Um, there was a regulation passed last year, which is specifically about um, collection of data on additional support for learning and um, places certain requirements upon um, the Scottish Government should we um, seek to substantially change the data collection. And that is that we are required to publicly consult. And as part of that, we would consult the committee as part of that process. Bring in Ms Lamont. Thank you very much. Can I just ask, just before I'm asked the supplementary I wanted, 
We have been informed that the number of categories published is reduced from 21 to 5, and that uh, they're not, they are not, so the, but the, the, there will be management information available on request. So it would be the case that on the information which is narrowed, we wouldn't have to put in an FOI for that because it's, it's now categorised as management information on request. Is that right? So we wouldn't have that circumstance again. I mean, I think the it, it I think you're making a slightly false distinction between um, between the processes. Um, it it depends a little bit on the nature of, of, of the requests as to exactly how we handle. I mean, routine requests for you know standard information where we've, we've this is information produced. with respect that used to can you let right so, let so it was twenty one to five. Sorry, Miss Lamont, can you let Mr. Wilson finish his point? Okay. And I can let you My back apologies. in. I think, as, as I said earlier, in, the, in this particular case, because uh, we were asked to release uh, information that we'd, we'd previously deemed to be of, a, of, of a, a lower quality in terms of the distinction between the two categories, we felt it was appropriate to go through the formal process uh, for FOIs. There is, of course, as was said earlier, a, a set of, of requirements and restrictions uh, on us a, 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 around that. We receive you know, a, a vast amount of requests for information and data through throughout the year. A, a lot of them are handled as, as freedom of information requests. Um, some of them require, uh, in some cases, protracted discussions and debates with the requester about the nature of the information that they want, the level of detail that they require, uh, whether they want personally identifiable information and so on and so forth. We cannot handle those requests um, through the FOI process because the process does not enable us to have that ongoing okay. debate. That wasn't really the point I was making. The reassurance that was given is that it's being given that you're reducing the categories from 21 to 5. You're still gathering the information, yes. but that management information would be available on request. Yes. It's pretty straightforward. Isn't it? That's not complex. It's what is already there. It's to give us reassurance that when you're reducing the categories you're reporting on, you still have the other information available. And I think we would want reassurance that that is actually what was happening. But can I ask maybe just... Very specific. To go back to this question about additional support needs, the nature of the support that a young person has and why it matters, and I think it's been particularly well highlighted by Jenny Go Ruth about you know, this catch-all description may not capture what's happening in our schools. I note that when we look at teachers, we're able to identify all sorts of things about their age, their gender, main subject, contact time, whether they're doing training as a charter teacher, or headship teening programmes, whether they can teach in a Catholic school or indeed can teach in a Gaelic medium school. We gather all of that information. Are we able to gather the information about the skill set of people who are working with young people with additional support needs? So, uh, I think yeah. it's more, it's more a, a question for Laura Meikle, I think. Okay. I think that's a statistical... No, I'm asking you, is it possible? Do you ask <laughs> your statistics... I think Do you want information that tells you that somebody who's characterised as a pupil support assistant has got training or qualifications in autism awareness, working with young people with learning disabilities or whatever, given the scale of the information we're prepared to take from teachers? Because I think there would be a concern that the implication is that there's a school teacher and then everybody else just does stuff round about it, when in fact these jobs are highly skilled professional jobs in their own. Do you try to capture the scale of professionalism amongst those offering additional support needs? So the, as I said earlier on, um, I use a wide range of, of evidence in order to inform our policy decisions. Um, would you I, ask, would you ask the local authorities the scale of qualification, professional training of people who are, who are supporting young people with additional support needs? Going again to the point that Gordon MacDonald made earlier about the importance that there's a match-up between the identified additional support needs and the support that's been offered. Do we, do, do we attempt in any way to capture the qualifications and skills of those who are working with young people with additional support needs? So the, the, um, the discussions that I have with a wide range of people, including education authorities and um, parents, families and others, um, do touch on those issues. Um, I wouldn't use a, right. a national So you don't touch on these issues and discussions around teaching, but you do touch on these issues and discuss them when it comes to the really important issue about the scale of expertise and professional qualification of those people who are offering additional support needs so in the, schools. The, I suppose the, the, the point that I would make is that it depends. The, the way that, that, that I use the information may be different. So if we are looking, for example, to um, consider what additional, what additional training might be required um, nationally for children, for um, those working with children and young people around inclusion, 
or around autism, um, I would go and ask those specific questions. I wouldn't um, necessarily use um, a national um, statistical survey to get to do that because I'm, at the same time, I'm looking to find out a, a whole range of other information. Um, and so I would use um, those engagements that I've talked about in order to cover a whole host of, of um, issues, including, you know, when we're talking about training, it could be how should we deliver that training best? How, um, what do people need to know? What, what is the balance of the information that people are requiring? How can we ensure that um, any training that we, that we bring forward can be, for example, um, something that's recognised by professional recognition, mm -hmm. uh, recognition through the GTCA. You see, if there's, an issue, the if there's an issue that we would suggest is actually happening, that there's a generalised support for young people to support staff in the classroom with young people additional support needs, which has increased in the way that Gordon MacDonald has identified, that, that support is very generalised. One way you could establish that it's just the title, it's different, but not that the support is different, is simply to ask, when you put down the category of additional support needs, person, somebody who's that, that job, do they have a qualification? Do they have a professional qualification? Do they have training? Yeah. You know, it would be for other people to decide how, how that question would be framed. Do you think it's a reasonable question to ask that you, you, that you want to know the scale of the professional qualification of people who are working to deliver additional support needs in the classrooms. I think the question there, I mean, is is the requirement would be to move from uh, an aggregated return, which gives us a number of, of staff in these categories, to an individual level return for uh, all of the types of support staff uh, that we have. The reason we have that information for for, for teachers and for pupils, as it happens, is because we have an individual level return for each individual teacher working within the system it allows us to ask the details of those individuals why we would don't we currently not do, do that? we don't currently do that for mm -hmm. support staff um partly because uh, that would be an additional very significant uh, burden upon the providers of that, that information for local authorities uh, in particular for the grant aided schools themselves to extract yet more uh, personal level uh, detail on those individuals um it also depends on the use that we're going to put those those data to um Teacher workforce planning processes, for example, require us to have a level of detail about the, the, the demographic profile and other things about teachers to enable us to look at the factors that influence the demand for, for teachers going, going forward. We're not involved in a, in a formalised workforce planning process for support just, staff in any way. I... And I think we would need to think very carefully, I certainly need to consult publicly and more broadly if we were going, that would definitely represent a, a change in the methods, the methodology for, for this type of information. Um, that would be a, a much more substantial formal process to, to, to look at the potential changes to, to get to that level of detail. I, I will say, though, that it is not the case that, you know, as I said in my opening statement, I think that what we've always done will be what we, was, we will always do. Um, we do change statistical collections, we introduce further detail in some things, we withdraw some detail from some things. Uh, when they're no longer uh, appropriate, we've made changes, for example, so we are making changes to the early learning and childcare uh, collections to reflect um, some information about qualifications to, to, to report on the additional graduate um, uh, commitment and, and so forth. So um, changes like that are, are plausible, but they, they, they can't simply be, be, be taken uh, unilaterally by us to, no, to no, reflect a particular demand have, for information. You have made significant changes when all of them have been given us less information than we had before about the nature of the support that's available in in, in schools. Um, I wonder whether, given, again, the, the figures that were highlighted by my colleague Gordon MacDonald on the scale uh, of need and the reports from families, from others, who say that the, the needs of their young people have not been met, is maybe there's a time now for workforce planning for people who are delivering additional support needs in the classroom and a proper understanding of what they're actually able to do. And there is an, actually an issue about diminishing the important job that's getting done in schools by simply generalising it in a way where we don't really know, and we're not even asking, how skilled is this group of people are, how many of them are there there, how many are able to identify support for individual young people and their very specific needs, as opposed to the very kind of general categories that have been highlighted elsewhere? So, um, I think that the, the we are, um, as part of our consideration through the um, Advice Group for Additional Support for Learning, looking at the collection of, of data um, in relation to, to additional support for learning. Um, but we are considering that in a slightly different way. Um, 
at the moment the um, collection focuses on input information rather than outcomes information and so we are trying to work through whether or not we can change um, the information that we gather um, to look at what difference um, has the support made to the individual children and young people who have received it through a range of different measures. Um, that would um, mean that we would have to look at different ways of collecting information um, beyond um, the statistical collection we've discussed this morning. Um, and we are currently discussing that with the advisory group for additional support for learning in order to um, consider what are the different, um, all of the different ways in which we would need to gather that information together. I think there's a need for workforce planning for additional support needs that recognises and values the job that they do. I think we already um, recognise and value the job that, that um, additional support staff do. That's that's not in question at any point in time. Um, Except you've put them into a broad category where they may be doing that, they may be doing something completely different. I, I, with due respect, I don't think that, that, um, th that the fact that we've made a, a decision to draw together two categories in a, a census devalues our respect for the, the children, for the people who are providing support well, to our children. We don't even ask them. Schools. We ask, I've already listed all the things we ask of a classroom teacher. We're not even asking groups of people what their qualifications are, the appropriateness of their training, and indeed their qualification, their capacity to support young people with additional support needs. We've just lumped them all together, and it, it looks like a category now that really doesn't tell you very much at all. We can consider with um, partners in the advisory group for additional support for learning while we're doing our broader work on, on the collection um, around additional support for learning and those matters. Um, but I think we also need to um, take account the views of our um, of COSLAN and the Association of Directors of, of Education um, as part of that process, so, which we'll do. Sorry, are COSLAN and ADE saying they don't want workforce planning for, for people with, who no, but, provide additional support needs? But respectfully, um, COSLAN and ADE are the employers of the um, of the people that we're do referring to. Do you know to. whether they think there should be workforce planning in this area? That has never been raised. The, the need for workforce planning has never been raised within any of the forum that I, any of the fora that I have engaged with. I'm happy to to have that discussion um, as part of the, the data collection um, discussions that we're having within the within the advisory group for additional support for learning. I, do, I don't think anybody is fixated in si entirely on the data. It is about the quality of the support offered to young that. people, and actually. The people who are collecting the stats and are trying to make sure these stats are robust as possible have one job to do. There's a separate job to do, which is yeah. about understanding what the stats then tell you. And yes. if you don't ask the question, you won't know. And that's, I think, the, the grave concern is that we're not actually understanding, the, as we said, the scale of the problem, the challenge to the um, teaching staff and to support staff and to ensure that people are properly supported. As I've said already, I think that, that um, as part of my um, work to um, support implementation of additional support for learning, we look at a very wide range of evidence in order to inform our decisions, um, which goes beyond the, the, the strands of information available to us from, um, from the statistical information. Um, therefore, I, I would argue that we, we do have a good understanding of, of the um, position of implementation and, their, and that that information allows us to inform the actions that, that we choose to take in order to support implementation further. Um, Mr Mandel, did you want to want in? Yes, thanks. I did. Thank you, uh, convener. I wondered, uh, Mr Wilson, before you sort of seem to suggest you'd be willing to look at different questions, would, would, would you consider um, ideas that came forward from the committee after today? in terms of new questions to, to ask in this area? Uh, but the short answer is yes, we, we, we'll, we'll, we always look at the, the wide range of users and their interest in, in the data that we have. Um, Parliament and committees are, are part of that user, user group, so we, we, we will, of course, look at those. Uh, although, as I said just a minute ago, some of those are not uh, additional questions that can simply be uh, tagged on to the to the current process. Some of them would require a, a very fundamental change to the way that we collect uh, education data across across the system in, in Scotland, and that clearly comes with a associated process and, and a set of requirements upon us. And, and the decision will have to be balanced up against all of those impacts. Thank, thank you for that. Um, I wondered how much discussion you had with um, individual local authorities mm -hmm. around the data they are collecting. 
before you design the questions. Because I'm, for example, mm. thinking of my, my own local authority, which will, for example, collect data on how many hours of one-to-one -one support they provide to young people, because that has to be uh, agreed at, at, at a regional level. Do you ask things like that to see what local authorities in general are, are collecting? Um, yes, I mean, we have um, an extensive and an ongoing process of engagement with, with, with local authorities on, I mean, I outlined the list of the data collections that we that we bring in at the beginning of, of this session, and, and you know, that requires us to have a pretty close uh, ongoing relationship with a range of people in, in local authorities, from directors of education or children's services down to uh, d uh, um, management information specialists and, and, and data providers. Um, we get uh, extremely useful feedback from them about um, how they capture the data initially from pupils, from parents, from teachers, how they store it within their management information systems, how that matches or doesn't with the way that we seek to extract it and the terminologies and, and, and uh, guidance that, that we issue. We are fairly continuously updating the guidance to reflect that some of those changes, um, some of which came as a part of part of this this process um, on support staff. We, we made some changes to the guidance. Um, we know there is a lot more information held within the management. I mean, this is data that is held by schools and by local authorities so that they can run the education system that they provide. Um, we don't uplift all of the data that, that they have. That would be a, a, an infeasibly huge exercise and, and actually would, would leave us with data that we have no practical use for whatsoever. But yes, we have an ongoing uh, conversation with local authorities. We have a specific network um, where we bring them together at least once a year to, to talk about kind of current or forthcoming issues around these sorts of things and can explore these sorts of options as, as we did in the case of the pupil support assistant category. So in your professional experience, do you think that there is, is more useful information that could, could just be out there um, and you know, that you're, you're not picking up on at the moment because this area hasn't, you know, I'm, I'm not being critical, but no. it's, you know, in terms of where the prioritisation has been, you know, it, you know, it maybe hasn't in the past. You've been, you know, it, those avenues haven't been explored fully. Do you think that's a possibility? Absolutely. Yeah, it's it, it's it, it's it's always. I mean, I, I think I would be surprised if that wasn't the case. To be perfectly honest, um, I think the the question remains as to whether we need to uh, source that information on a regular, routine basis in the way that we do with this type of information. And we have an annual collection of these sorts of things. If if local authorities or any other administrative data holder has information that we have a particular need for or use for at a particular time, uh, there are mechanisms we can use to extract that on a one-off basis to, to, to kind of give us a snapshot picture of, of what's going on rather than establishing a, you know, a, what what is we have to recognise a reasonably onerous annual process of, of, of providing data. So there, there are options, but I would be surprised if there wasn't uh, if there wasn't more data that, there that, that would be of use to to some. Um, and just, just as a final question following on from that, um, you know, you talk about the possibility of being able to do one-off uh, work. Mm -hmm. I mean, given the concern there's been around this particular change, uh, certainly from, from, you know, from across colleagues on the committee, you know, is it possible that you could do you know, a sort of one-off bit of work Sort of just probing, you know, pro probing some of the sort of changes, just just so that you know, certainly as a committee and as a parliament, we could we could understand, you know, what you know what what those those different categories being being merged actually mean. I, I think it's possible to do to do work like that. I, I'm not currently in a position to think through all of the various options that might be available and the, what the correct mechanism for doing some of that would be, whether it would be through the sort of work that Laura describes, working with the uh, the advisory group, whether it's, uh, you know, qualitative information coming from a select group of, of local authorities who've already given us some information through this process, whether it's a, a, a one-off da data uplift of, of some sort, you know, we would have to, to think about those. But, you know, if there's demand and a need for those sorts of things, then those are the sorts of questions, broader analytical questions rather than mm -hmm. statistical questions in, in, in that, that come to in, us regularly. In theory, there's nothing to stop you, for example, doing a sort of one-off survey of there are a snapshot of on a day in September, you know, who's who's doing what within ASN, for example. There's no in theory. There's nothing nothing to stop that. Philosophically, there's nothing there's nothing against that idea. There may be practical barriers and, and other limits to, to to how we would conduct that and fund it and so on and so forth. But it, but in philosophically, no, there's no. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, finally, Mr. Greer. Yeah. Um, I'd like to stick with this issue of uh, the individual versus aggregate uh, method of, of collecting the data for a moment. And like colleagues, I'm not a statistician, so I uh, may misunderstand this. But my understanding is that the collection of the teacher data 
uh, individually allows for distinctions to be made on, for example, where teachers uh, deliver multiple subjects, so someone who teaches both math maths and physics or history and modern studies. Because of that method of collection, they're not double counted as a maths teacher and a physics teacher, and they're not counted as just being a single full-time maths teacher. That distinction is made and that informs, uh, for example, our ourselves in, in Parliament of what the capacity is, what the full-time equivalent capacity is, delivering maths, delivering physics, etc. I understand that the shift of collecting the data on support staff from aggregate to individual would be a considerable one. But who, just to be clear on the, the process, who would make the decision about whether or not to seriously explore that option? There's, there's, there's two things in that. One, one is, um, just, just to clarify on the, on the teacher, you're right that we do collect information about the subjects that um, individual teachers um, provide we, we have information on their their main subject, um, but we also have information on on other subjects that they can they can teach. What we don't do though um, is uh, assign proportions of their time to those subjects, so we can't tell from the data we have. So we may know that a, a teacher who works full time in a given local authority is primarily a physics teacher, but that they can also teach maths. What we don't know from that information is is whether they actually teach any maths or whether they, they spend half their time teaching one and half the time teaching the other. So we can't, we can't quite measure in the way you described exactly what teaching resource is provided in practice to individual subjects. Um, on the question of, of how we would decide whether to explore this issue of, of moving to a different, um, a, a different collection process, I mean, that's, that's a, I guess in many ways it's quite an organic exercise, a, you know, a need from users and a demand uh, would ar would arise. Uh, it would be discussed uh, certainly in internally first in the way that we've dis described um, for the, the current change. We would discuss it, the, the plausibility of it at least with the data providers. If we're going to ask them for different types of data, um, you know, it, it's good to, to have a starting position of knowing whether that's even a feasible uh, thing that they could do or, or, or not. Uh, and, and then there would be broader discussions with the, with with Roger in, in his chief statistician capacity and, and uh, you know if that then starts to look like something that's worth worth exploring we will start developing options and, and looking up then there would need to be a formal uh, public consultation on, on that sort of change because it would be regarded as a, a significant change to the, the collection methods for official statistics and as Laura says in terms of ASN in particular there is other legislation in place which requires us to consult on, on those sorts of changes before any decision uh, is taken. Thanks. I, I think there's there's an appetite here from, from these users for that to, to at least be explored, but That's on key. the point of, of other users, other stakeholders in consultation mm. with them. To go back to a discussion almost at the start of this session, uh, Laurie mentioned in, uh, in exchange with uh, Joanne Lamont the um, Additional Support for Learning uh, Advisory Group, stakeholder group, yeah. being consulted on issues around this. Yeah. Were they consulted on this particular change in the way the statistics are published? No. The, the when we had the, the discussion with them, um, the, there, there, were, there was a pe particular piece of business that the advisory group was um, considering at that point in time, which was around about statistical information. And so we were reporting to them the fact that there, this issue had arisen and that there was a need to, um, to have additional quality assurance in order to make sure that the information we provided is, is robust. Um, as part of that, I explained that we were um, considering a number of um, ways to resolve that, but we didn't um, consult them specifically on the the, the matter that, that we discussed. I had I laid out to them a number of approaches we might take. Um, if you don't mind me asking, why not? I mean, that, that is the additional support for learning advisory <laughs> group. Surely that's a group of people who should be sounded on something like this. Because once you've got a specific proposal, you can take that to the group of people who you have assembled as being Absolutely. relevant experts, those with an interest in this area, and ask them what the implications would be. We had done that as part of the discussion when we talked about the different options. So I, I was aware of what the views were. Um, as I said, it wasn't a specific, um, do you think this particular piece of of this approach is what should be done. It was these are the things we might do. Um, which of those feel um, so, so appropriate just to, be to you? Clear, the, the the approach that was ultimately taken um, was one of the specific proposals laid out. It was one of the things we discussed. Yeah. What was their feedback on that specific proposal? That there, were, there was no there was no concern about it. That that um, it was appropriate. Um, we we regularly um, discuss. Um, Statistical information, and other evidence, as part of as part of our work. So it was it wasn't a it wasn't a non routine discussion, if if I can put it like that. It was it's the type of business that we we carry out within that um, within that arena, um, alongside the discussion that I talked about earlier on in terms of changing 
any potential changes that we make to the, the data collection in terms of moving to outcome. So um, it was quite routine. It wasn't a, a standout discussion for them. That's the only way I can describe it to you. The only reason that the um, there wasn't a specific uh, question asked was A, that I already was aware of the position of the group, but also just that, that the group weren't happy to meet at the time. Right. Um, and to, to move to a, a different area, but still, still relevant to this, um, are you aware of what is causing the quite significant discrepancies between the, uh, the data that you're collecting through the census and the data being issued by local authorities under freedom of information requests by, uh, in response to external organisations who are asking for the same information? Uh, so I, I think this is an issue that, that does crop up from time to time um, where people will compare uh, official and national statistics with information that's been issued through freedom, freedom of information requests. Um, very often what uh, tends to happen is that information, freedom of information requests are made on uh, for specific pieces of information where uh, which which on the face of it may seem to match up what is um, the official statistics report on but at, in actual fact uh, there's, no, there's not exactly a, a clear and an equitable match there. Um, so, uh, to give you an example, um, when you ask a local authority how many teachers they have, they may return to you the full-time equivalents or they may return to you the headcount. So that can obviously give you two different sets of numbers, which um, on the face of it you've asked the same question, but you've got two different answers. So um, yeah, I think, I think that's one of the, the, the things that we, we have seen from time to time with, with that type of um, request. Range of across a range of areas, we 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 quite often see, and and you know sometimes those FOI requests that have been sourced from you know across 32 local authorities come to us for review. Sometimes we see them in the media and, and you know, try to reconcile those numbers with the numbers we have across a, uh, across similar similar sources held centrally. And, and I would say that in my now fairly considerable experience across a range of areas of, of government, that it's it's rare that those numbers will will match because the the response and the guidance, you know, the statistical collection comes with a set of guidance around how to, to complete the, the return and, and what should be included and what shouldn't, uh, and the FOI request necessarily, it doesn't, that, that, nor should it, but that's, that is necessarily going to lead to a discrepancy between the numbers that you return. Yeah, I'm, I'm aware of some of the inconsistencies. I think my office are trying to compete with certain journalists in Scotland in the number of FOI requests we send out and, and trying to resolve the, the inconsistencies in what comes back. One, the one that's been specifically raised with us, um, which you might be familiar with, is uh, the work that the SSTA, the Secondary Teachers Association, has done. Now, some of the inconsistencies there are quite quite considerable. So the, the uh, example given is um, additional support needs teachers in Dumfries and Galway on a particular day. Um, the difference uh, is 92 ASN teachers was what they were informed of, um, but the um, census indicates it was uh, 38 ASN teachers. Now that's quite a considerable difference. That's that's more than what I've encountered when trying to resolve the, the differences between FOI and census data previously. So, uh, uh, there's a number of things I, I haven't had a, a chance to kind of investigate this particular issue. Uh, there's a number of things off the top of my head that I, I think uh, uh, could have contributed to this difference. I've, I've already mentioned the difference between FTE and headcount. Uh, there's also the fact that the information will have been gathered at different points in time. Uh, there will be definitional differences there as well. Uh, one thing we see is is a, a bit of a um, uh, an inconsistency in the way the term ASN is used and that um, some local authorities will um, talk about ASN schools where we would refer to them as special schools. So um, we, we may here be saying the number of teachers in the special schools rather than the number of teachers whose main subject is additional support needs. So um, that's just a few of the things off the top of my head that I think may have contributed to this, this yeah. discrepancy. I'm aware that that's a, a specific example that if you don't have it in front of you, you obviously can't provide full, full context on it. I think the committee would benefit in terms of the context of any further work we take on this, if you'd be able to have a look at that and provide a, a written response about why you think there's an inconsistency there, we'd, we'd find that quite useful. And that's me. Thank you very much. Can I just ask a final question about the census? Um, is there a statutory duty on local authorities to return the census information? Education Scotland Act uh, requires local authorities to return data to uh, the Scottish Government. So, so there is a broad duty to return education data, such as we, we require um, the return of 
the census itself is not specifically uh, described in, in legislation. Okay, that's fine. Thank, thank you very much for your attendance at committee this morning. Uh, I'm going to suspend uh, and for five minutes and then go into private sessions. Thank you.